Good morning, welcome to Reconciled. We're just getting started for our Reconciled Morton, bright and early in the cold morning. Um, just wanted to introduce you guys to our pit crew Sunday. So we have a pit crew where we've got leaders that come together monthly into a cohort of learning and we learn uh, the skills and everything we need to do to become better preachers. And so once a month here at Reconciled, they get a chance to fill one of the pulpits. So today we'll have three different messages uh, from three different preachers in our three different campuses. So I hope you enjoy. I hope it uh, helps to encourage and challenge your faith. Good morning. It's good to be with you here again this morning, this fourth Pit Sunday, as we continue our study of 1 John. We're going to be looking today at 1 John chapter 4. Don't turn there yet. Uh, if you can just listen while I read a portion of 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this time that we have to gather together to worship you, to look into your word and to learn together, to grow together. Father, I pray that as we study your word today, you would just open our minds so that we can understand what you have for us. Open our hearts so that we can accept it and put it to use. And Father, we give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was about eight or nine years old, my dad decided that he wanted to become a private pilot. He took the classes, he wrote the tests, he passed all the tests, he flew with an instructor, and eventually he was able to solo and log some uh, flight time. He completed his IFR, his instrument flight rating, and eventually he got his pilot's license. Shortly after that, he did buy himself an airplane. Uh, this was a Stinson 1083C model. It was a, uh, they called it the Stinson Station Wagon. It was a high fixed wing airplane. Uh, they call them a tail dragger because the tail wheel is in the back instead of a nose wheel in the front. It was a single engine uh, propeller airplane. One day, uh, Dad decided he was going to log some flight time. I think this was a Saturday, and he asked me to go along with him. And that was great. It was just him and I, which meant I got to sit in the front seat with him. This airplane had two bucket seats in the front and a bench seat in the back, which was enough to really make it a five-passenger plane, although it accommodated six of us uh, because uh, some of us were still pretty small. And so we... Uh, Took off that Saturday from the local airport where he kept his plane tied down. A little grass strip, kind of like the uh, uh, Morton Airport out here. And uh, one of the things Dad liked to do is called buzzing the house. He would come down low over our house and the noise of the engine and the sound of the prop would shake and rattle the windows and rattle the dishes in the cupboards. And Mom would come running outside and she would wave to us as we flew over. And it was just great fun. So dad decided on this day that he wanted to buzz the house. And so we circled around until we located our house below us, just about 10 miles from the airport. And he lined up on it and he began diving toward the house. And the house got closer and you could see it through the windshield. And it got closer and it got closer. And all of a sudden, bah, 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 the engine died. And dad... <laughs> Uh, quickly jumped into action. He pumped the primer a couple of times, which uh, forced fuel into the cylinders and hit the start button, and the engine roared back to life. And we gained altitude, and we were able to fly safely back to the airport. I learned something that day about airplanes, and that is that you can have a perfectly good airplane that functions the way it's designed to. Uh, it has wings, it has a tail, it has flaps and a rudder, uh, it has an engine, it has a propeller, the tanks are full of gas, even has a pilot in the seat. But when the airplane loses power, it can no longer operate the way it was designed to. It will no longer fly. And this is a lot like us in our Christian walk. We can have everything we need, and we're given everything we need when we accept Christ as our savior and accept the penalty, the, the payment he made for our penalty. 
And yet, when we don't have the power, we're unable to operate the way we were designed. And that power is the Holy Spirit. So it brings up the question, how would we be different? How would our life be different if we were fully empowered by the Holy Spirit? We don't have to wonder that because God's provided the answer for us through the writings of John. And John was not just one of the disciples. He wasn't just an apostle. He was part of Christ's inner circle. He was a close personal friend with Jesus and walked with him in some tight spots. And so John writes for us. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. While you're finding that, I'm going to just review what we looked at real quickly over the last few weeks here. 1 John chapter 1. John tells us that we've been given a new life. He, he describes this life in verse 2. This is the life that we were designed to have. Uh, this is the life that in Genesis 2, when it says God breathed life into man, it's part of God's essence that we were designed to house. This is also the life that God said, if you eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, in that day you'll surely die. And when Adam and Eve did that sin, we lost that God essence. We lost that life. But that life was brought back to us once again with Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And he opened the way again for us to have communion with the Father and have that life again. He talks about light, and God is light. And the brilliance of God's light leaves us feeling bare, laid bare, because of our sin nature, because of our identity as sinners, and because of our specific acts of sin. We feel like that criminal that has fled into the dark and is hiding under the tree and hit with the million candle power mag light and is laid bare and can no longer hide. And that's how we feel in God's presence. But we're also told in verse 9 of chapter 1 that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That life is restored to us, and we can now emerge into the light. We no longer have to be afraid or lay, feel laid bare. And he closes off this concept in first two verses of chapter 1, of chapter 2, where it's a picture of us in, in the courtroom of God's judgment, but Christ is there with us. It says we have an advocate with the Father. He's our defense attorney. And it also says that he is the propitiation for our sins, which means he's the payment. Our defense attorney has already served our sentence for us. So we can go and we can stand before the Father and stand before his judgment and be found righteous because our defense attorney, Jesus Christ, has already served our sentence for us. Chapter 2, we find that we're given a new home. Uh, verses 3 through 5, we can know that we know him, and we can have that assurance, and that's part of having a new home is uh, we have that relationship. Uh, it talks about walking in the light as he walks in the light and living in the light. It talks about abiding in the light. This word uh, abide is meno in the Greek, and it means of a place, belonging to a place. And so when it talks about abide, and we'll see this word abide throughout the whole book of First John, I want you to think of home. Every time you see the word abide, you think of home. That's our home there. And then he differentiates between the light and the darkness. We can choose to continue in the darkness. We can choose to continue to walk in the darkness. We can choose to continue to live in the darkness. But for Christ's sacrifice, we've been provided the opportunity to emerge into the light. And the more time we spend in the light, the more that light becomes our home. Third chapter, he talks about we've been uh, given a new family. Uh, a family that's marked by forgiveness and love and a sense of belonging. For the first ten verses, he talks a lot about how awesome God is that he's lavished his love on us, that he called us the children of God, and so we are. That's how he opens chapter 3. And we become part of this family, this family that's marked by forgiveness, love, and a sense of belonging. This family resemblance. Uh, my son, uh, when I was working in an office, he would come to the reception area. And the first time he came there, the, the secretary didn't know who he was, but she came back to me and she said, there's somebody here to see you, and I think it's your son. She said, he looks just like you. And what she meant was, sure, there was a physical resemblance, and there is that there, but 
he also has spent enough time with me that he started to talk the way that I talk. He started to uh, adapt some of the same mannerisms that I have. And this is what God, uh, in, in the first 10 verses of chapter 3, describes to us. We gain that family resemblance. And the longer, the more time we spend with God in prayer, in Bible study, the more we pick up his character and the more we resemble him. It also says that uh, we're not recognized by the world because the world didn't know him. Uh, if my son had gone to the wrong office building and asked for me, they would have known who he was. They wouldn't have recognized that he was my son because they didn't know me. They wouldn't have seen the resemblance. And so it is for us now that we're in God's family. We pick up those characteristics, but the world doesn't know God. And so the world doesn't recognize those characteristics in us as well. But as brothers and sisters, as part of the family, we can recognize that in one another. He talks in uh, chapter 3, verses 11 through 15, about love for your brother. And he uses the negative example of Cain, uh, chapter 4 of Genesis, the story of Cain and Abel, and how Cain hated his brother and couldn't let it go and ended up in murder. And how if we hate our brother, it's the same as murder. And so um, we see that this family is marked by forgiveness. When we're part of God's family and we build his character within us, uh, it's marked by forgiveness. It's marked by love. Uh, verses 16 through 18 of chapter 3 talks about uh, we have to love our brother. It doesn't, it's not the feeling. It's not that tickly butterfly in your stomach when you're close to someone that you admire. Um, this is an act of the will. You choose to do something for them that doesn't serve your own interests, but serves their interest over yours. And this love is marked by acts of love that we do. If you see your brother in need, then we need to help them. We need to provide for them what we have the ability to provide. And then finally, chapter 3 talks about this family is marked by a sense of belonging in verses 19 through 24. If you're at uh, chapter 4, with me, let's just back up a little bit and uh, pick up chapter 3 and verse 19. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if your heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And this is that sense of belonging that we have being part of God's family. And so, uh, just to recap, we have chapter 1, a new life, chapter 2, a new home, chapter 3, a new family. And then finally, in the last verse of chapter 3, John introduces this new concept. He says, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So now John is building a, a series of blocks here. Uh, think of Legos. And he puts down the first Lego and he says, you've given a new life. And a second Lego, you've, you've been given a new home. And a third Lego, you've been given a new family. Now he brings out this gigantic Lego, the spirit that God has given us. And it locks all of these together. In the first verse of chapter 4, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. One of the things that, um, as I experienced flying with my dad, that I would see is he would do a pre-flight check. And he would, he would turn the yoke and see that the flaps turned like they were supposed to. He'd work the pedals and make sure that the, the, the uh, rudder worked correctly. Um, and one of the things he would do is he had a glass Coke bottle and he would go out to a little spigot on the bottom of the wing where that gas tank was. And it's a little spring loaded and you could push that bottle up and a little bit of the gas would dribble into that bottle. Now, airplane gas is dyed red. I don't know if you knew that or not. Because you can hold that up to the light and as you're looking through that with that red dye, you can see any impurities in there. You can see any contaminants, whether it's sediment or whether it's water that would get in the gas line and cause you to lose power. So that was part of the free pre-flight check was always to check the gas with that bottle and to make sure that there weren't um, any contaminants in there. And this is kind of what John is talking about here. 
if there are contaminants in there that blocks the power, we need to get rid of those so that we can continue to have that power of the Holy Spirit within us. And those contaminants can be things such as what we watch on TV, the books we read, uh, social media. There are all kinds of things that can divide our attention from God and that can rub, rob our power of the Holy Spirit from us. Um, there are also um, maybe uh, ministers that you listen to. And it's our responsibility as believers, and I hope you do this even after you leave today. Check what I tell you. Go back to the scripture, read it over. Don't take my word for it, because this is really between you and God, and you have everything right here to have that relationship and to make that relationship grow and to have an informed relationship and to access that power of the Holy Spirit. So don't take my word for any of this. As Tim speaks, don't take his word for it. Uh, a minister that you see on the TV or on the radio, be sure that you go back to Scripture and that you check what they're saying and make sure that it's accurate. One of the things uh, that I learned, I, I recently retired oh, a couple of years ago from 30 years of law enforcement. And part of my experience in law enforcement was as an investigator, a detective. And detectives' primary job is interviews, is talking to people. Um, when there was a crime, usually it was uniform patrol that would respond to the crime scene. And they would collect evidence. They would take photographs. Uh, they might make an arrest if they had enough evidence at the time. but any of the cases that came to an investigator, they would have collected the evidence and taken photographs. They would have spoken to a few witnesses and gotten brief initial statements. Uh, they might have a, a suspect, they might not. But all of this was put together and handed over to an investigator. And our primary job as investigators was talking to witnesses, talking to people that were there, um, and determining their credibility. And this is a little bit what John is talking about here. Um, you had to see sometimes if there were four witnesses over here saying one thing and one witness that had something totally different, what would be a potential motive for him to lie to me? Not everybody likes to tell the truth when they're talking to police officers, believe it or not. And so you had to weed through that and see would they have a motive for being dishonest with me about what occurred. Sometimes it would be they were involved in the crime, and it was to protect themselves. Sometimes it would be to protect a friend or a loved one. But you had to weed through that and determine if there was a motive for lying. You had to weigh what they had to say against what other witnesses had to say and compare it and see if it matched up. Um, you also weighed what they had to say against the physical evidence that was collected at the scene. And sometimes they would tell you something, and you would look at that physical evidence. You'd look at the photographs and say, there's no way it could have happened that way not the way they said it. So this was uh, a manner of determining the, uh, the credibility of what they were telling you. Starting in verse 2 here, it says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, not capital A, the Antichrist, but the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of against Christ, anti. Which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. And so one of the things that a uh, department would do to build up staff to be good investigators was uh, put a new investigator with an experienced investigator. And you would follow them around. They would give you some tips. They would teach you how to do an investigation. Bigger departments that had lots of staff would often assign a junior detective with an experienced one. And this uh, more experienced detective could walk along with them, do investigations with them, and mentor them and teach them. And so what we see here is that the spirit within us is our experienced investigator. He's our mentor. He teaches us how to discern. He teaches us the truth from lie. Verse 4, it says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We have that experienced investigator, and the wool can't be pulled over your eyes as long as you depend on the filling of the Spirit. You depend on the leadership of the Holy Spirit as you study the Word and as you listen to um, other, other teachers. In verse 5, 
says, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In Ephesians 4, 14, Paul says, as we attain toward the maturity of Christ, it says we're no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and defeat, deceitful schemes. And so as we grow in the spirit, as we submit ourselves to the spirit and yield to him and let him lead us, uh, we will be able to uh, discern truth from falsehood we will be able to uh, um, have that ability to um, listen to the spirit and not to the false to antichrist spirit of antichrist and false teachers from here john goes on to tie together what we've learned in the previous three chapters he says beloved let us love one another for love is from god and whoever loves has been born of god and knows god Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And so we see in verses 7 and 8 this uh, idea again of being part of God's family. It says, whoever loves has been born of God. And so John is bringing back this idea of uh, being part of God's family and plugging it in here as a review. Verses 9 and 10. In this, the love of God has been made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is the second time John uses this word in the, in the passage up to this point. And so he's reminding us of what he talked about in uh, chapter 1, being part of a new life. And might, that we might live and that we have the propitiation, the payment for our sins so that we can have that renewed fellowship with the Father. Verses 11 and 12, he revisits the idea of a new home. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. And there's that word, abide, same root word as abode, a home. So he abides in us, he makes his home in us. And here's that concept again of we have a new home. God abides in us and his love is protect, uh, perfected in us. And then in verse 13, he ties it together. He puts that last Lego on top and locks it all together. Because this is the key here. By this we know that we abide in him, make our home in him, and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And it's that spirit that gives us the power. It's that spirit that gives us the ability to access those other uh, gifts from God. Starting in verse 13, um, John wants to remind us that we can have assurance. We can have confidence he says, uh, starting at verse 14, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God and God in him. So we see that uh, John is... Uh, once again, reminding us that we can have confidence, we can have assurance that we are in God's family. We can have assurance that we have this new life in this new home. Uh, seven times in just this portion, not in the whole book, but in this, just this portion, he uses the word know. He wants us to know that we can have confidence, we can have assurance. He throws in, uh, we have seen, we believe, and that we can have confidence. And so he uses this concept over and over again that we can have this assurance. Second Timothy 1 7 says, You've been given not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And the idea here is that we have forces that are pulling us into the world. We have um, relationships. Uh, we have uh, relationships within our workplace. Uh, we have uh, media that, that 
attacks us. We have different things that pulls us into the, the frame of the world. We have the word of God. We have prayer. We have fellowship, things that pull us into God. But we have this division. And so what Paul is saying here in 2 Timothy is we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a, and a sound mind, a unified mind. We don't have to be pulled in two directions. He goes on uh, in verses 19 through 21. I'll, I'll back up and, uh, and let's start at verse 17 where I left off. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been protect, perfected in love. And again, it's the same thing that Paul was telling Timothy in 2 Timothy. We're not given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. He goes on to say, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Fourteen times in this passage, John uses the word love. So I think he's placing a priority on that as well, and he wants us to get it. He wants us to get that this life, once uh, led by the Spirit, uh, empowered by the Spirit, is going to be earmarked by love, a love of our fellow um, Christians and, and a love of man in general. How do we love like that? How do we love as God loved? How do we love perfectly it's not natural to us humanly, obviously. It's just not built into us. But it's by yielding to that spirit, that, that uh, control, that filling, that leadership of the Holy Spirit that we are able to love others. Let's flip over real quick just as we bring this to a close to the Gospel of John. Now let's begin in chapter 14. And this is right toward the end of Christ's ministry. Chapter 14 is in the upper room. This is the last meal. This is the Passover meal, the last time he's going to be able to share a meal with his disciples. So he's sharing, he's laying out what's on his heart, the most important things, because this is the, the last little bit of time he has with them. In John chapter 14, starting in verse 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it, ne it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. He goes on in verse 25 of chapter 14. These things I've spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He closes out here right at the end of chapter 14. He said, rise, let us go from here. And here they leave the upper room, and he's going to the garden where he knows he's going to be arrested. He knows he's going to suffer beatings and a kangaroo court trial. He knows that he's going to be crucified and die. And so this, he now is beginning the long walk to the garden. And he continues teaching. I see him walking with his disciples and walking and talking and sharing as they're walking chapter 15 in verse 26 he said when the helper comes whom I will send to you from the father the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father he will bear witness about me and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning he continues on this long walk in chapter 16 he's still walking with them and talking to them and teaching them Verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I do not go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he goes on in uh, verse 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare, declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take away what is mine and declare it to you. And then finally, uh, 
as they approach the garden, the last thing he does, and this is so amazing, he stops for a second and he prays for his disciples in their hearing, in their presence. How powerful is that? And as part of this prayer, beginning at verse 20 of chapter 17, he says, I do not ask for these only, but for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them as you love me. And I love the beginning of this passage. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Christ was praying for us at that time. He was looking out over hundreds and thousands of years because here, here is the eyewitness testimony. And so when he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. We have John's words here. We have Matthew's words and Mark's and Luke's. We have those eyewitnesses, and they've presented their testimony, and we have those here. And so Christ is looking out through the ages, and he's seeing us, and he's saying he's praying for us as well. The good news is the story doesn't end with Christ's death because it it uh, continues after death with his resurrection. And so, in closing, let's just look real quick at Acts chapter 1. Christ has now risen from the dead, and he spends another 40 days with his disciples before he ascends up to heaven, continuing to teach them. And the last thing that he says before he leaves is this. Chapter 1 of Acts, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. We will fulfill what we were designed to do. You will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, right where we're at, right here, that's where they were at the time, in Judea and Samaria, the next neighboring counties, East Lewis County and Chehalis, um, Cowlitz County. He says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This word power here is in the Greek the word dunamis, from which we get the term dynamite, is the English, would be the English translation. And so what he's saying is, you have given, you're given this power by the Holy Spirit, this ability to do that which you were built to do, what you were designed for. So we see that the Spirit is the power in our engine. This is what is required to live the Christian life, is the indwelling of the Spirit and the empowerment by the Spirit, us yielding to the Spirit so the Spirit can lead us. In just a moment here, we're going to be have a chance to take communion. What a perfect time for us to remember not only what Christ did for us, the body that was broken for us, the blood that was shared for us, but a time for us to reflect on that and to give ourselves over to that. If you're here today and you haven't surrendered yourself, you haven't stepped up into the court of God's judgment and thrown yourself on the mercy of the court and pled guilty and then had your advocate step in and provide his righteousness for you, I pray that you would just do that today. You can do it right where you're sitting. I ask you to just announce to God that you recognize your identity as a sinner and your acts as a sinner and ask for that forgiveness. If you are here today and you've done that, I ask you to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You may have made that commitment but never really surrendered yourself. You're holding on to some things in your life that aren't helping your Christian walk. I just ask you to confess, to repent, to renew your walk with him and allow the Holy Spirit to fill those gaps where you push those things out that don't help your Christian walk. And finally, if you're here and you are walking in the Christian life, you're walking in the Spirit, I just ask you to be, continue to be empowered by the Spirit through study, 
daily Bible study, taking that word, the eyewitness testimony, the physical evidence is right here. Prayer, communicating with the Father, knowing, giving him your concerns and letting him talk back into your heart through the Spirit. Through worship time, we'll be able to enjoy that shortly here. And through sharing, through ministry, sharing your time, giving of your time to help others, giving of the resources that you have financially or physically, giving of your vocation when you're in your workplace, letting the Spirit direct you there. That's your, another mission field that you have in your workplace and in your relationships, your husband and wife, your brothers and sisters, your parents, your uh, friends. I just ask that you would let the Spirit control all those areas of your life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for how you have provided us that helper, that support. You've promised that you will never leave us. Father, I thank you that you will guide us. You will prevent us from being led into falsehood if we depend on your spirit for discernment. I just pray that each one of us today take the time to look into your word, to spend time in communion with you in prayer and worship. Father, I just pray that we take these words with us today and just let them impact our hearts and our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.